Hello everyone, good morning. A lot of people are still outside, but they eventually will come in. <laughs> uh, so for our second date, I hope you are all okay, fine and well rested. Uh, we will continue now with the, the training course, the integration of electromobility in the urban transport networks by Mr. Dominic Bray from Coda2. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank Take you. our minds off. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so good morning, everybody. I'm quite happy to see you here. <laughs> and I hope you will uh, learn something during these uh, four hours. We will be together. Uh, I will talk in English, but uh, I think it's better for, for everybody. But some of the slides are still in French, I'm sorry, but I couldn't translate all because you will see uh, it will depend on what you want. So uh, just to present myself, I'm Dominique Broy, a member of the CODATU, of the board of CODATU, and I'm still a consultant uh, for, the, for local authorities and municipalities, and mainly in electromobility and urban logistics, essentially, to help them to develop systems or to integrate these into their uh, sums and to deploy them in the future. So, and I've been previously um, the manager of the research uh, in a school of engineering in France, in La Rochelle, which was well known for this development in electromobility since 20, well, since the beginning of the, 20, uh, the 2000s, yes. And, uh, well, I've been working with the city and many cities in Europe. Uh, we, have, we had a lot of projects all over the Europe and sometimes somewhere else in, in, uh, in other countries, but mainly in Europe. So during the last uh, 20 years, dealing with uh, the vehicles, and at least the vehicles, we, we tested vehicles, we, we had vehicles at school, and we developed with Peugeot and Renault electric vehicles. And we also uh, well, implement uh, systems, uh, electric uh, electromobility systems like buses, like car sharing, uh, vehicles and so on. So that's why I'm talking to you about electromobility today. And uh, well, to, to start with, it works. Well, today I will uh, discuss of three things with you because I need you uh, to define exactly what will be the content of the training. <laughs> We will see later. So we can talk about the context, the evolution of the context, and what it is, what it could be in the future, <laughs> and what is uh, for today uh, possible, or what we could envisage for the for the future. We could have some example of some examples for of implementations of uh, well, I can discuss of some or present some uh, experimentation or some deployments that are, have been made. And uh, we can also uh, discuss about uh, recommendations for the deployment of, uh, well, to integrate better uh, different, uh, electro different modes. Uh, can be uh, buses, can be BRTs, can be car sharing, can be, it, and so on, and so on. So, so that will be open a bit to you. But before that, I'll come back to, well, if you remember, uh, we sent you, uh, uh, you some uh, questionnaire some, <laughs> some times ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of you, I hope, we are, you are here, uh, well, uh, answered this questionnaire. And so the, uh, the outcome of that, uh, the first, the main, well, for, for, for the objective, that was for the objective, sorry, the, the title is missing. The objectives for many of you were to decrease the energy consumption and to, to, to improve or to the independence regarding fossil fuels and to decrease conge congestion or improvement of traffic flows. Well, uh, just to discuss a bit about this, okay for the, de for the decrease of the energy and the independency, but uh, regarding the decrease of congestion, if you uh, change uh, ice cars with electric cars that won't change the congestion, okay? If you put bicycle, you can de expect to decrease the congestion, but don't expect if you change uh, uh, um, ice cars 
buy electric cars, there will be the same number of, electric, of vehicles. So you won't decrease the congestion. So be careful. Not, with, not in that way you can <laughs> decrease. But you can decrease the congestion if you improve, for instance, the number of bicycles and if you put more electric bikes or two wheelers or three wheelers as well in the system, in that way you will decrease the congestion because you will have less user of uh, automobile, of cars. Okay? Uh, and the others, well, to facilitate the accessibility, it's a big question, in fact, because Nobody knows yet uh, if this is uh, credible or not. Because for the time being, electromobility is quite expensive. If you need to buy a car, to buy a, even to buy a bicycle, and sometimes to buy a, a scooter. So it's not yet, uh, it's maybe an objective, but it's not yet a reality. And of course, to improve the quality of of air, it's, it's really the, the, the one of the main uh, results uh, of, well, we can discuss of that a bit later. Another question was, what was the uh, most suited transport modes, electric modes, uh, in your uh, region or in your city? So, uh, for many of you, most um, big majority of you, that was the mass transports like BRTs, trains and trams, which are electric, of course, and buses. And uh, big shared cars or individual two or three wheelers, as I spoke bit, uh, before. And the main drivers for you were the traffic regulation, where to have some dedicated, dedicated lanes, some priorities given or facilities given to electric vehicles. And to have, of course, and we discussed a lot yesterday, you discussed a lot about charging stations in public spaces, and we can also discuss of that again. And of course, the accessibility of energy, the, 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 the fact that you have to pay for this energy, uh, which is for the time being a bit more expensive than some years ago. And we will come back also to that in the, during this uh, session about the procurement, procurement rules that could be uh, set up but, uh, by uh, local authorities for the procurement and so on. And this goes with the construction rules, in fact, uh, because if you oblige the new buildings to have uh, charging stations inside, then it could be also another uh, uh, administrative way of uh, uh, fostering the development of electric vehicles. And the main barriers, of course, lack of charging points. We'll come back to that. The, 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 auto, the range, the autonomy range, which is for me a false question because uh, up to date now, we, we don't have, well, I mean, this is not really a problem in the end, will be uh, less and less a problem because the vehicles are now, uh, well, currently, uh, having uh, something like 400 kilometers before two, uh, or cars, I mean, before uh, two, two recharge. But what is most important is, is the lack of competencies in many, uh, in many sectors of activity. I mean, in the manuf at the manufacturers, at the operators, at the uh, local authority staff, and so on and so on. So this is a main problem, a big problem. And to raise awareness, what are the most important things? So most of you uh, uh, say, uh, well, wrote that it was to implement BRT's bus fleet and so on. So just in line with the previous question, some of them, some of you were uh, answered about the logistics. That's nice. <laughs> because uh, it's also a big problem, the logistics, the urban logistics, and of course it is important to have also some actions regarding the uh, drivers or, or, or the companies which are uh, logisticians, and to encourage the ownership of uh, individual two or three wheelers, which is also a good way to uh, foster the uh, deployment of electromobility. So, uh, before going to the global context, I would like to know a bit more about 
What are your expectations? Okay, uh, before starting, because I want to uh, answer your question, not only uh, what I'm trying to, 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 to discuss with you or to, to show you, but my, my concern is to answer your question. So, uh, ask somebody a specific question or a specific expectation about this session, learning more uh, about electromobility or or a specific uh, uh, question about the implementation of buses or something like that, and so on and so on. Ask somebody some... Yes. Um, what is your experience maybe between bigger and smaller cities? Because some of us come from semi-urban, semi-rural. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, we come from semi-rural, semi-urban uh, cities, so we would like to know maybe what are your experiences when you implement something like this in a city like Athens? Or mm -hmm. in a small city like mine, uh, Tripolis, uh, which is like 45,000 inhabitants. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, I will note that. And as a... Yes? Um, I would like to learn more about um, the electromobility in urban logistics and especially different uh, implementation and uh, business schemes. Okay. Different options. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dominique. Um, I would like to learn a little bit about myths. So, um, for example, when we when we try to to promote e-mobility, but not e-cars, uh, in my case at least. Um, there are always arguments saying, well, you know, the production of the batteries and blah, blah, blah also has a big impact on the environment. So also to work on this myth um, and finding good arguments for e-mobility. Thank you. Well, no other questions for the time being. So, uh, well, maybe you will have some questions in the future of our in the next meeting minutes. So, uh, I will try to answer this question along this. Okay, I won't uh, put them away, but I will try to. to I will uh, answer these questions, especially because I'm, I have the same problem as you have now. <laughs> trying to, to implement uh, electromobility in rural areas, which is not easy. Okay, um, so, well, uh, well, we start with the global context first, but I would like to show you that, if it works. Germany in the year 2035. Cars with combustion engines are on their way out. Within the last 10 years, electric cars have taken over. They already account for more than 50% of private transport, and that figure is on the rise. Electromobilization and digitalization are changing the look of our cities. Most e-cars are equipped with an autopilot function. They find parking spaces on their own and roll into the nearest parking structure without a driver. That leaves fewer and fewer cars parked out on the streets leaving more room for living space. Lively street corners are not as loud as they used to be. Even regional freight traffic now runs mostly on electricity. After a cup of coffee, Motorists use an app to call their cars out of the parking structure. The car comes right away and has just the right air temperature inside, both in summer 
and in winter. That goes for car sharing vehicles too, of course. They take passengers directly to their destination or to the nearest train station, depending on the chosen mobility service. The electric cars travel more than 500 kilometers on a single battery charge, thanks to the further development of lithium ion technology. A battery is made up of several cells. While the car is driving, lithium ions wander from the anode to the cathode inside the cell, creating a complex layer of metal oxide. Some vehicles are already equipped with electrode materials that can handle more charge carriers, providing them with even greater driving ranges. Other cars have the motor integrated into the wheel, opening up a whole new level of freedom. Public charging stations complete with cables are available on some streets for short-term parking. But most electric vehicles park in the parking structures where inductive charging systems are installed on the floors. After one or two hours of charging, the e-car has enough electricity to drive 100 kilometers. High-speed charging stations are located at rest stops along the expressway. With a power output of 350 kilowatts, just 10 minutes of charging provides enough energy to drive 300 kilometers. Some cars can even produce their own energy. The latest trend in 2035 is the solar edition. On a sunny day, nearly two square meters of high-performance solar cells produce enough power to drive 100 kilometers, no matter if the car is standing still or driving on the expressway. The batteries have a very long cycle life. Normally, the batteries last longer than the car, as a result, the battery gets the chance to have a second life after the electric vehicle dies. At home, the battery is charged with solar energy for the night. And in larger units, the batteries provide stability to the power network of the future with an ever-growing proportion of renewable energy. When lithium-ion batteries reach the end of their life, they can be recycled in special facilities. The process preserves all the important metals, including lithium, and feeds them back into the raw materials cycle. Germany's energy transition coincides with a change in transportation. As the number of electric vehicles rises, so does the amount of power production from renewable sources. The electromobilization of road traffic is changing our mobility and making an important contribution to climate protection. Okay, so that was five years ago. <laughs> okay, so what do you say? Well, that's the future. It's, well, at five years ago, it looks a bit unrealistic yet. But uh, now, uh, it seems quite realistic. Maybe not in 2035, but around 35 and 40. That will be a bit like that. And uh, probably you will have scars as they just showed or, or, or envisaged at the time. Do you have any reaction with that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just a comment, uh, reaction that I had in the video, that some of the most relevant impact 
that were shown in the video in, uh, on the urban structure were really more related to automated vehicles than to electric vehicles, which is something different and could open uh, some days of discussion of which would be the impact. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes, uh, in fact, yes, it's a bit, uh, well, automatized, automated vehicle oriented. But, well, uh, I mean, some uh, facilities or some, uh, yes, facilities of the cars, like uh, self-parking, uh, well, you could do it already today, in fact, in some cities, not everywhere, but you could, because the, the vehicles can do that if they have the right technology. Maybe not going around to, to find a, a, a space uh, for parking, but just going to the next car park. It could be possible uh, in, the real f in the very short future, according to the distance you have to, the vehicle has to drive. But that could be possible, in fact, yes. Well, we could also talk about uh, automation or automated vehicles later, but uh, it's, uh, I think it's 10 years, because it's 10 years, uh, probably we will have the, the availability of doing that. Yes. Yeah. But in that case, we should ask whether that would have a positive impact. Because if parks go, cars, the automated cars decided to go in the super, back in the suburban area, because parking ah. is cheaper. No, you can have some limits. To do. <laughs> you yeah. will have to have some limit. And there's a lot of questions about that because uh, in 10 years, in fact, uh, not all vehicles will be automated. So what? how they will manage going with the, well, the ancient, ancient vehicle or, or self-driving or driving uh, vehicles with drivers. So it's a bit complicated. Even if uh, there are no more ICE cars, there will, be, there will still be vehicles with drivers inside. So what's the, the, the mix or, or, or the, the, the behaviors of the drivers and the automated vehicles in between, that will be, it's another question. So that's why sometimes it's, uh, well, <coughs> To go parking in a, some in place not not very far from where you are, okay. But to go 10 kilometers away, mixing the two type of uh, driving, it's still a bit complicated. I have a, well, the other way would be to have some um, places or streets which are not allowed to uh, or um, uh, restricted to automated vehicles, like you have uh, zones today. That could be, and uh, other places for drivers, for vehicles with drivers. So it's a, it's a management <laughs> of all that. And we, you will have uh, to, to manage this transition, because we are going to that, of course. It's, well, it's running now. Ten years ago, I wouldn't have said that, but pretty, pretty sure now that we are going to that. Everything is still pushing in that way. But for the next 20, 30 years, to up to 2050, we will have we will have to manage this transition, not only the energy transition, but also the driving transition of the uh, deplacement or travel transition. That's uh, that's the future. Any? Yeah. Merci. Euh, je pense que le documentaire que vous avez projeté tout à l'heure relève plutôt de la science-fiction que de la réalité. Euh, à mon avis, euh, ce sera peut-être quelques euh, pays euh, développés qui vont euh, arriver à ce résultat, mais une grande partie des pays dans le monde euh, vont euh, continuer euh, à subir les problèmes de la mobilité non durable. Euh, dans le document... Euh, on voit euh, quelques voitures, euh, or dans l'avenir, le nombre de populations va augmenter, euh, le niveau de vie peut-être va augmenter, euh, la technologie sera améliorée, donc le, le nombre de voitures sera appelé à être plus important et on va entrer dans le cadre de ce cercle vicieux, plus de voitures, plus de congestion. Donc c'est pour cette raison, moi je ne suis pas euh, tout à fait d'accord avec cette vision très rose de l'avenir euh, de la mobilité. <rire> Merci pour cette réaction. Thank you very much for this uh, remark. Well, I agree with you and uh, and not. I, <laughs> I agree with you that, of course, it's a bit uh, something well 
uh, a dream, if you want. Uh, and maybe, as you said, that will be in some cities, maybe in European cities, that could be e easier. But, uh, well, I've been working recently uh, on the future, uh, on the, well, something like the, the national strategy for the, for, for uh, in ASEAN countries like Cambodia or, or Vietnam. And uh, where, where the, the, well, the mobility problems are a bit different because there's much less car, more bicycle and so on. But uh, they are still in the same way, not maybe at the same horizon of time, okay? Not for 2050, but they are on this way also up, well, maybe 20 years after, okay? To have this, and the problem is not the cars, they are, they are in these countries, there are more the, the bikes and two wheelers and three wheelers, that's the same problem with congestion. But the idea is also to, to improve, to change the mobility behavior also, to have more, because that in this uh, video, there's no, uh, they don't talk about buses and mass transport and so on. So the prerequisite of that is also to have a good uh, uh, mass transport, if you want, or a good bus network of buses also. That will also reduce the number of cars in the cities. And this is possible in every country. <laughs> if, if, you look for, so if you look, for instance, what is, uh, going to develop in Dakar, for instance, or Casablanca. Uh, well, uh, I think this, this city will arrive quickly with in such in the same uh, way. Not, maybe not with all electrics and self-driving cars, automated cars, but they will arrive in 2050. I, I'm sure they will arrive. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, it's right, I comment, then a question. And maybe I'm a little bit of the devil's advocate, but um, for me, this, this video, and also taking into account that it was shot five years ago, um, it looks to me more like a, a, a movie from the car lobby rather than from the <laughs> Umweltbundesamt in Germany. Um, I, I do not understand what's the, what's the purpose behind this, honestly, because I also think that if they would do a similar movie video these days now, they would reconsider a lot of things. They would uh, maybe or hopefully consider a more human-centered approach. Um, and even if they just put some e-bikes <laughs> in the movie or some buses or tramways. In my city, I'm coming from Graz in Austria. The, the tramway system is working since more than 150 years. And it's the immobility, actually. Mm -hmm. So I'm, well, as I said, it's more a comment than a, than a question, actually. Thank you. Yeah. I agree. Well, <laughs> it's just what I said before. B buses and mass transport are missing there. I agree. Well, the, the purpose of, I don't know the purpose of the video itself, mm -hmm. but my purpose was to make you uh, some remarks. <laughs> what, you have, what, what are your remarks with such a vision? Before. Yeah. Um, I would agree with my colleague about the human-centered. Um, and also I was thinking that we are speaking about developing countries and we are speaking only uh, from a European perspective of what development is. And we are speaking only about financial development, economic development, and we forget about social impact. And I was wondering who is going to have access to this kind of cars? Who is going to be able to afford to live in this mm -hmm. kind of lifestyle? We're speaking about a very small percentage of the population, even in the European cities. Mm -hmm. And after one crisis after another, I'm not so sure that people are willing to take even more weight on their shoulders, uh, considering the transition and the financial aspect of that. Um, and this development, we really need to question it, maybe. Development is not just about having fancy technology and more money. Mm -hmm. um, there are many developed countries in Africa and in Asia from a human-centric point of view and not from a financial point of view. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, I agree also with you, of course. This is more a technical point of view. Maybe not fi only financial, but uh, purely technical, yes. And car-oriented, as you said uh, before. Uh, and some... Uh, well, uh, of course, bicycles are missing. They just talk about car sharing, so you could uh, 
well, extend that to bike sharing and also, and also other visions. But it's uh, just one technical as approach, which is not complete, of course, but uh, yes, the, the, the um, social and human uh, aspects have to be considered when you do that, when you try to, to, to improve mobility. It's just a question connected to what they were mentioning, and I'm asking more out of curiosity because I don't. I mean, I I do think that of course it's partial in this video concerning one specific uh, plan or idea, but it's undeniable that there is um, a morbid <laughs> focus for electromobility for cars rather than sometimes electromobility that is more human-centric. And why do you think is that so? Because I, I'm, I'm seeing that quite a lot in policy. Like, I hear that more than, I don't know, talking about e-bikes, people verge the conversation towards e-cars. So why do you think is that so? Well, uh, it's a bit compli <laughs> complex as an answer, but... Um, I think, well, you have to mix, in fact, when the, the, the idea behind that is, as you mentioned, and we will talk later about that, is when you uh, try to develop electromobility as not only one mode uh, to, 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 to think about, and you have to integrate and to um, envisage all modes according to the uh, needs of the population and the travels of the population. So you have to care, to, to, to care about that first, as it was mentioned, because mobility is just a, a tool to, to, to help people to go somewhere. So uh, you have to, according to, of course, you, you don't uh, develop mobility and electromobility in the same way if you are here, if you are in Paris uh, or in France, if you are in Senegal or if you are in Cambodia, it's not, or, or, or in Quito. Uh, it's not the same aspects you have to develop to, to, to take in account, into account the local uh, usage or utilizations of modes. For instance, if you go in Africa or, or in Asia, you have the tuk-tuk system, the rickshaw system, the bicycle system that you don't find in Africa, that you don't find in, or not the same way, in uh, South America. Uh, so it's completely different. And if you have to develop electromobility, there's no uh, only one mode, one solution, and so on. The, the most um, uh, standard uh, that you can find everywhere is the mass transport. Okay, so you need the mass transport everywhere. If you want to decrease the, the congestion, if you want to, uh, to organize the mobility in your city, you need mass transport. And uh, so trams, trains, BRTs, and the network of buses, and the network sometimes of paratransit organization or systems behind that. And then you can have other modes of mobility uh, as you can see in some examples later on, uh, from this mass transport, or also you can have individual, and you can also have, uh, as, because that's also a question, urban logistics. <laughs> you need to care also for urban logistics, and you can, but you can also use uh, mass transport uh, for uh, urban logistics. That's possible. That's been done in some cities using. Uh, trams to transport goods, for instance, in the first was Amsterdam, but it has been done every, uh, in somewhere in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Bremen, for instance. <laughs> I remember, uh, what was it? Dresden. I can't remember. Well, uh, uh, well, in well, in Russia as well, <laughs> but uh, it has been done somewhere. So you can you can use mass transport and uh, well, electro electric mass transport to to to, to transport goods as well. Okay, no other comments on this? Yes, another one. Thank you. Uh, actually, I don't see such a distinction in the future between uh, mass transportation and uh, uh, autonomous, let's say, cars. Because uh, if you look at uh, automated shuttles, uh, they are just called pods. So, in the future, the trend is 
uh, automated self-driving vehicles. But uh, uh, there's an Italian startup in Padua, and they presented, I think, in Dubai Expo, uh, which is called Next, uh, and are simply pods carrying eight people, which can, with, uh, and they can um, form a sort of train. They have doors, so if you connect more pods, you get a train, autobus, whatever you want. Uh, I think we will see uh, a big shift in, uh, in mobility. Of course, uh, uh, electrification is the trend, and it's only the first, but uh, it will be a revolution, a completely revolution. I think in, uh, maybe, uh, in 2035, uh, the ecosystem will be much different. Of course, it will be mixed because uh, private cars will not disappear, uh, will disappear probably gradually. Uh, and the, the problem will be to manage this coexistence of self-driving and uh, driven, human-driven cars. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I see the, the trend is in mobility as a service, so no more private vehicles because uh, the self-driving vehicle uh, has, uh, um, has a reason uh, if, you, uh, if it's integrated. There's no point uh, to have a car uh, with uh, drive you, drives for you. Uh, uh, hmm. It's uh, useful if uh, you can aggregate different trips. So uh, if a car can pick up several people uh, and optimize, so uh, fighting against uh, traffic congestion. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, municipalities uh, should, I, I believe, uh, should uh, uh, regulate uh, traffic. So uh, no... Uh, Mm, no one people in a vehicle in, uh, in mm. the center of the city. So you, you should have hubs uh, around and uh, uh, vehicles carrying a uh, few people, just one or two, uh, are for a uh, low density area where, where mass transit uh, 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 fails. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. Well, the, 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 not the problem, but the difficulty with uh, small vehicles, shuttles, okay, is the, the frequency. Uh, well, when you talk about mass transport, it's uh, very high frequency uh, systems. With these uh, shuttles, which exist since, well, between the Amsterdam and, uh, and the airport, there are the shuttle, automatic shuttle since now uh, almost 20 years, I think, at least 15. Uh, so the shuttles exist. If you look, for instance, there's one in Dubai, I think, also. There's plenty in uh, London airport, uh, everywhere. But they are on fixed row, a fixed lane, fixed. Uh, so, uh, but the difficulty is to the, 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 um, the number of people they can carry at once. And the, the, so it's not uh, possible everywhere. You could, you could have it in some parts of the cities, but not they cannot replace mass transport, in fact, because they don't have the capacity to transport pass uh, enough passengers. That's the problem. And another way is that uh, since they are automated, they are on fixed routes, uh, so you can go everywhere with that for the time being, in the future, maybe. And also, as you mentioned, the, this, uh, the automation in general, uh, the difficulty will be in the, <laughs> in the rural areas because it's a bit complicated to have, uh, for, the, for the time being, for the vehicles to get there, uh, well, to know where they are. But the, the, the GSM are not yet enough precise and they don't, uh, well, they can't envisage everything, the vehicles. So it's not for the time being, but maybe in the future. So, uh, if we don't have any more questions, we can go on. So, I wanted to, to talk about some uh, evolutions in the society. And uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me if you, if you have questions and so on, because I have no more videos or not uh, at least for the 
in the, in the letter if, if uh, we have time. Um, so, we have uh, the society has changed or is changing. The demography, we've talked we've talk of that. The digitalization, you know that. We've talked of that also. Going to the, uh, the society and quality of life and the economy. Uh, the, um, the society, we have now more a demand for soft modes. Oh. Yes. Uh, um, yes, you, you, we create, you have new urban, urbanization concepts. You have, we have new uh, um, expectations about what is a city, what is, a, what is the life in the city centers. That, of course, change the uh, ways to travel to these cities and change also the ways uh, we uh, organize the, uh, the city centers and the city uh, life. Uh, we have also the, the development of the collaborative economy and the sharing principles. And more and more people and young people are not having cars just because they prefer to share cars or cars or vehicles, in fact. And the demography, and the, we, we talk about that. Sorry. Um, another change also, which was go ongoing. Uh, and of course, the COVID situation, the pandemic and so on, just increase this. But the delocalization of work. Uh, well, so the, the, what's, well, regarding that point, what was good with the pandemic is that uh, it forces, it forces the, the people to work at home or to, to have some uh, uh, telework uh, everywhere. So people, and we had uh, the experimentation of what is possible and what is not possible. Because this trend, and that was the trend in the US, and now it's... Uh, it's even, well, it's everywhere for many, many reasons. Uh, people who can work in peri-urban areas, not quite rural, but sometimes rural, uh, they do prefer. Well, in my small village, uh, people are working uh, at home because the, the next city is 30, 40 kilometers away. And they, they can work at home. Not everybody can do that, but a lot of people can. And in the future, uh, both, both for the transport of goods and the uh, of some goods, and also on the, the type of works, a lot of people will prefer to uh, work uh, in well, semi-rural or rural areas. So that will um, decrease the, the the demand for travel inside the cities. That for technical reasons, for uh, economic reasons, for a lot of reasons. But, and we know better now, since the last two years, uh, what kind of work could be done at home without, and how it will be uh, possible, not to work uh, the full time at home, but how to split the time between work at home and work in office, because uh, people need to, to work in office also to meet other people. That's natural, and a lot of things you, can't, you cannot do at, uh, when you are not in the office. But so we, have, uh, we will have a decrease of uh, uh, home work uh, travels in the future. And I will go very quickly on that, but uh, as you said before, uh, the uh, urbanization, we have several models that McKinsey proposed three models, three different models. You can have plenty of other models. So, but the idea behind that is that we will have uh, several types of urbanization, several types of inhabitants in these urban, in the cities or urban uh, sectors of the cities, and that we need different uh, traffic or, or, or uh, transport or mobility systems to meet the demand of these uh, of these people, so we have. Well, this was clean shared, private autonomy, and seamless mobility. They are just concept, in fact. But behind this concept, you have the possibility of developing more or less uh, 
uh, independent of mass transport or etc. mobility systems. I will just jump over the next slide because <laughs> well, you will find that. Okay. Another thing is uh, the, the car market because we are on the, also on the cars. Uh, that's the uh, well again McKinsey, but it's more recent. Uh, the 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 different scenario uh, on the market of EVs, including hybrids. Okay, that's not only battery vehicles, but uh, included hybrids. So you can see that the expectation the, the is going very very fast in our countries. So, but this. Uh, and the, the difference uh, since 2002. So you see that uh, the vehicle power and battery, the difference in the, in, in the prices. We'll come back to the prices and to the cost after. Uh, and also we have a different, uh, well, I can't have time to have uh, all this explained, but uh, in fact, the idea behind that is to develop what are the, some arguments <laughs> uh, in, in favor or not of the uh, electromobility systems. So uh, today, well, the main strength is that the, a lot of people are convinced, uh, manufacturers and so on, obliged also uh, to, to go to electromobility because of the trends, because of what I said before, that was the main strength. However, however, the weaknesses for the time being are mainly the, uh, the infrastructure linked to the infrastructure, okay, because we have not yet developed the correct infrastructure. That's a thing we have to think about, but it's still to be developed. Uh, the threats, the threats, uh, also, uh, the dependence on the uh, materials with, and on sometimes on the energy system. And the main opportunities, of course, are the goals, <laughs> the ambitious goal we have in, uh, for, for, for the national uh, strategies. So that's the same. And now uh, I will go time is running. I will go um, on the technical evolutions. We start, well, I won't, probably you know a lot of things, so I will go uh, quickly on that. Uh, two and three wheelers, there's more and more uh, two and three wheelers. Well, you can find them everywhere. The main advantage is that, well, of course, they are more affordable than a car, and they can be uh, assembled locally. Okay, so that's uh, important in several countries that you can import or develop some uh, uh, some parts of the of the vehicles, and you can uh, have some uh, impact on economy, local economy since they can build the, 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 the vehicles at, uh, in the country. Um, well, the interest, well, you see the, <laughs> the change, uh, the, the emissions, so uh, you have to, uh, ah, something I forgot, uh, the comparisons. And the main problems, with the main problem with them is the, 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 the batteries, because the batteries of these uh, two wheels are still, for a lot of them, still uh, lead batteries, or uh, low quality lithium ion batteries, in fact. So uh, they need to be recharged qu <laughs> quite frequently. Uh, there's no real uh, recycling uh, uh, process behind that, or, or organization. Not well, not the recycling process itself, but the way the, 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 the batteries are removed from the vehicles and stored or, or, or sent to the recycling, it's complicated. The regulations are uh, complex and also uh, they are not, uh, well, the charging is not always easy. That's also a, a difficulty and a weakness in that 
in that sense for them because uh, you can some of them you can swap the battery for the smaller one and no you, you can take the battery at home but uh, for others the batteries are fixed for the so bigger for the moto for instance uh, and you cannot so you you need to have a charging station and then it's a bit complicated Anyways. for the cars well okay uh, I will pass quickly uh, the main thing is that we have more and more vehicles that you know, and especially the range of the vehicles is now well, for, is around 400 kilometers, even for, uh, 450 kilometers for most of the vehicles. Of course, it depends on the temperature, it depends on the way you use it, it depends on everything. It's a bit like a, a, a nice car if you go if you run very fastly uh, very fast or not uh, you 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 spend more gasoline or not okay the temperature is different um, we still have difficulties for 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 the charge and we will come back on that and uh, the fluctuation of sales you know well because uh, during the last two years the sales went down and then uh, they are still now going up or down. They are still increasing, but less than this, they increased before. And since the beginning of this year, in Europe at least, uh, the, the, the fluctuation, uh, the, the sales are going, uh, are, have increased. Okay, oh, sorry, more expensive. They are more expensive. Well, you know that they are more expensive than cars, and uh, that a lot of people don't know exactly what is. Uh, so I just go on that. For the uh, light duty vehicles, this is the same. It's a bit like the car. Uh, <coughs> the the variety is increasing, and all experimentations and all users uh, today uh, have uh, agreed that uh, these vehicles were, were have sufficient range, autonomy range to fulfill their uh, requirements or what they need to, to deliver the goods. So uh, there's no, well, even for for, for uh, user like uh, UPS and so on, like miss, um, people who deliver parcels, but also for craftsmen, also for uh, local deliveries and so on, these vehicles are quite fit and they are reliable. And for those who have uh, <coughs> developed uh, some fleet on that uh, with that the drivers are generally more satisfied with these vehicles than uh, ice vehicles okay so and since now with the new vehicles since now a bit uh, two years since two years the total cost of ownership are now acceptable i mean that the return on investments for these small vehicles around 3.5 tons the return on investment is rather five years. Uh, depends on what you do and the number of kilometers, of course, you, you drive. But um, it's between five and seven years. And the to total cost of ownership is going really low now. And in five years also, it is less than uh, the, the total cost of ownership of ICE uh, vehicles. Uh, and for uh, the heavy vehicles, uh, well, it's still in development uh, because, uh, well, they, they need a lot of power. So, and some of them are using not only for moving, but also for refrigerating the, 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 the vehicle. So it's a bit complicated. So there are, well, Around 18, 19 tons. Well, now it's almost the, the, you can find vehicles. Uh, well, not cheap, of course. They are more expensive, but the the the, the advantage of such, such vehicles is that you can enter some cities which are uh, which access are restricted to vehicles to, to to ICE vehicles, and you can enter the city centers with such vehicles. So, and it's in some. Uh, cities, it's important to go right in the, well, some uh, delivery uh, goods, the delivery of some goods. You need to go inside the cities. Well, it's better to have one big uh, truck rather than uh, several 
small vans. Well, it's better because of the cost of the drivers, okay? You have to take that into account, the cost of the drivers and also the congestion that you, uh, that, that you have if you have several vehicles and the time of delivery, okay? So uh, re if you have a global aspect, a global uh, evaluation of these uh, deliveries for some companies, it's rather uh, pro it's more profitable to use big trucks rather than small uh, vans because of all this uh, aspect of cost. But only for less than 20 tons for the time being. We will see later. And uh, of course, for, for more uh, longer distance, you, it's better to have, uh, well, for the time being, uh, LNG or R uh, CNG. And in the future, when it will work, the hydrogen systems. For the batteries, that's a very important thing, because, <laughs> okay, so, uh, for the batteries, we have uh, the progression of the batteries uh, during the, the last uh, 15 years, no, seven years. Uh, for the future, we will have new batteries, of course, uh, well, so more efficient, with, uh, well, more efficient with need means that you have uh, what we call the density, the power density, so you have uh, more capacity, if you want, for less weight, okay? And this is uh, pushed also by uh, other uh, sector of activity of transport, the uh, air transport, because they have, uh, we, we won't speak of that, but the air transport or the big air companies like uh, Boeing, Airbus and so on, have uh, roadmaps for 2050 to have some small small planes, I mean 50 seats, 70 seat planes, full electric. That's their own map. Okay, so and the main, because well, for the time being, in these planes, uh, all the auxiliaries are electric, of course, but they want to have the propulsion electric in so in 15 in uh, 25 years for small ones, and the main uh, the main point, of course, is the uh, weight of the batteries. Okay, so they are pushing uh, very, for, uh, very strongly on the development of new batteries, more than car manufacturers, in fact. And, oh, sorry, I don't know, I, uh, why the batteries, I will come back to the batteries, uh, the, uh, okay. Well, bus and trolleys, uh, okay, now, uh, in this, in this, uh, I will come back to the batteries later. I don't, why, I don't know why this. Uh, okay, uh, for the batteries, uh, for the trolleys, buses. You have a lot of. Uh, we we can talk of, of buses if you want uh, fully in uh, later on. But to to have a global view on on the bus and trolleys, uh, now the range is around 200 and 300 kilometers. The last one, the 12 and uh, 15, 18 meters. Some uh, buses are 300 kilometers, which is quite a lot on one charge. Okay, so it's now quite a lot and quite possible to envisage uh, only depot charging uh, for, some, for some buses, for some network. Uh, of course, the costs are still high. Not, well, some are a bit less than 1.5. It depends, of course, of the length of the bus and the, 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 the uh, capacity of the bus. But uh, some of them are 1.2, 1.3, so it's decreasing because the cost of batteries is decreasing and the number of buses on the market is increasing, so that's a bit normal. And now all manufacturers have e-bus since now, three years, three, four years, all manufacturers have e-buses. Um, well, they, are not, they don't have all the same performances, of course. Uh, for the buses, which is bit more complicated than uh, cars, we have to consider uh, several points, several aspects. The charging strategies, the infrastructure, the interface connections, and the vehicles. Okay, these are the main points if you want to implement buses, but we, we, we can go further in detail if we have time on these points. But you have to choose between the charging strategies, which can be mixed also, so you can have depot charging, for instance, and en route or opportunity charging. You can have 
the new things which are ultra fast charging, the new uh, way of charging. What is not quite obvious uh, to, to, to implement buses are the, the connection to the grid and the cost of the electricity, or the vehicles, you know, and the way you are connecting when you are charging. So there are several possibilities. Today, uh, electric in electric vehicles, we have this, sorry, it's in French, but uh, we have, well, the, the uh, articulated buses, uh, well, articulated and double articulated buses, okay, uh, so the batteries, well, it depends, of course, the batteries, because as you see, this, the battery, the capacity is between 360, uh, 600 uh, kilowatt hours. It depends on the way you use it. If you uh, use, uh, if you have only depot charging, so the bus is running uh, on the battery and come back, uh, because you, you need a big battery. If you have uh, charging all along the way, you can have smaller batteries which, of course, change the cost of the, of the buses, but uh, you increase the cost of infrastructure. So it's a balance between them, and you have to discuss of that. Yeah? Um, and there's also trolley buses, which can be charged during the... Yes. Yeah, so the trolley buses, yes. But we just... <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Uh, and you have the, the, the 12, 12 meters or, or, or 28 meters. You have the small buses as well. Okay, it was the same problem. And you have an Aurelia, which is uh, it's not a, an advert for this company, but there's no many companies who do that, which do that, the retrofit of buses to turn them into electric buses. So, uh, well, it's still experimental things, but it works. Because there are some uh, buses which, are, uh, which have been uh, transformed, uh, well, recycled and, or, or refitted. Uh, and it's also a, a, no, a possibility to have these buses to, to change uh, the, the ice motorization, to turn that into electric. Uh, motorization. So you just uh, you you well you, you change everything, and you you take off the you have, you put the batteries at the end with the, the the compressor, and you and you put the the batteries in fact instead of the different tanks, also. So you have them at the at the rear because. Uh, you take off the motor motorization and the, all the power train, and you can put also some batteries in the uh, tanks. So it's possible now, and of course, it's cheaper than buying new buses. Uh, it's uh, something like uh, cost us uh, between 60 and 50% uh, less than buying a new buses. And the next generation are the bus with the hydrogen, hydrogen buses uh, that you know also, but they are also experimental ones up to date because there are, well, there are several uh, networks we have bought which have bought uh, such buses, hydrogen buses, but they are still uh, on, at the experiment, not at the, at the demonstration or, or testing phases for the time being. They are, they, well, they are not yet, uh, well, I would say, profitable, or their total cost of ownership is not well known yet, because the, the cost of uh, the purchase cost is very, very high. So it's difficult to, 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 to say that they will have a, a, very, a good TCO, total cost of, uh, of ownership for the, well, for the next 10 years, but uh, since this uh, process uh, is progressing every day. Probably in some years it will be okay. And of course, we have, as a, for the cities, we need also to think about, for many cities, the waterborne transport, because uh, this also is electrified, 
and can be electrified even for for the for the for the freight and in some cities uh, they are developing very uh, they are pushing this type of uh, electric mode to transport passengers and to transport uh, freight and even with hydrogen as well <laughs> because some boats uh, not this one but some boats are uh, also uh, well, river boats have also hydrogen propulsion okay and for the future <laughs> of course also you can't <laughs> uh, you can't avoid to to envisage urban air mobility because uh, companies like Airbus uh, are working on that uh, to to develop this uh, kind of urban transport which is f totally experimental for the time being but in the future might be possible with all the problems uh, that, could, that could expect but you, you but uh, we were talking about uh, rural areas it would be probably uh, easier to develop that in rural areas than in cities because the density of travels is less so you could expect this could be also a way to uh, to, to, to satisfy some demands in uh, rural areas <laughs> yes why not uh, the drones are you uh, yes well, 2050. <laughs> so, uh, come back to the batteries. Uh, um, and then we, yes, uh, uh, I come back to the batteries. So, the next batteries, okay, uh, after, so we will have new batteries in the future. And, of course, we are talking also of the recycling of the batteries. So, the recycling processes are uh, developed. They exist, but they are not profitable for the time being because there are not enough batteries to be recycled. So, uh, for, for the end of life of the batteries, because as you know, batteries can be, uh, well, once they have been used in, in, on cars, uh, batteries can be also used after that to store energy because it's not the same uh, utilization of the battery when you use the battery for the for, for, for the cars to, to for the motorization of the car you need the energy aspect okay not the storage aspect you do the power aspect so with different when it's not suitable for cars it can be totally suitable uh, for uh, to store energy so that's why some of them uh, are used uh, in charging stations when you have a, f a quick charging or, or, or with a lot of uh, powerful charging stations just as a buffer from the grid. Or you can use simply to store energy because you need it in some places. So this is a second life and then you have the end of life and the processes are now uh, well, are known but they are not quite developed because they are not profitable yet. Okay, and now the cost of the batteries, uh, because this is half the cost of the vehicles in some times. So you see, uh, well, this has been done in, in uh, well, four, four years ago, uh, but we are still on this trend uh, because this is a new, uh, voilà, uh, another another one. So you see, we have almost the same. For, for different uh, studies, while well, the cost of the batteries will drop from, well, today it's around a bit less than $200 for one kilowatt hour, okay, the cost of the batteries. And in five years, in 2030, it will be less, much less than $100. So the cost, if you look a car, in a car, you have for the time being around 60, 70 uh, kilowatt hour uh, per hour. So the cost of the battery is, say, uh, 200, uh, 200 times that. So it's around uh, <laughs> compute, and it will be half the price in the in the future. It's around uh, 12,000 uh, euros, and in the future it will be much less. So. 
the cost of the buses going down, the cost of the vehicles also will, be go, will go down. Charging. Charging, you have several ways of charging. Okay? You have charging at home, you know. You have the small, well, the medium uh, range, uh, medium charger between 7 and 40 kilowatt hour. And you have the, uh, what we call fast charging, which is powerful charging, in fact, because it's not only fast, but it's, it's uh, you can charge for the cars for the time being around 300 kilowatts, uh, which is quite a lot. And you have several ways of charging, and of course, we can also talk about the uh, different uh, supply or sources of, sub of energy. So uh, I just uh, forget at the beginning, because it was on one slide, but I wanted to talk about, and this is the time, about the, the, the energy. Uh, because, of course, when we talk about the impact of vehicles on uh, CO2 emissions and NOx emissions and so on, of course, it depends on the mix of energy, which is a, a big problem for it everywhere. So, uh, according to the countries, you know that the mix of energy, the energy mix is not the same. Of course, some countries are more uh, fossil fuels to produce the electricity, and others are more uh, nuclear, like France, or uh, have more uh, renewable energy in the energy mix. So, of course, when you uh, and at at a local level, at a regional level, you are not uh, well. You can't do anything about this mix quite often, because well, the, the production of energy is rather at the city level, at the national level. So the strategy must be at the uh, national level. So it's a bit complicated for when you deploy uh, what you want to argument about the, uh, the impact, the, the good impact uh, on air quality of the, of the electric vehicle, it's difficult because of this problem of the mix of energy, how it is, uh, uh, well, how it produce the energy. But, well, and it's a large problem which well, there are many arguments, pro and cons. You can develop everything, but the, Ch <laughs> the, the Chinese, for the Chinese, well, because you know that in China, the electricity is mainly uh, produced with uh, charcoal, fossil fuels. But what the argument is, is that, well, the, the, the pollution is away from the cities. <laughs> Yes, there are pollution, but it's away of the cities, not in the cities. So when it's away of the city, in the countryside, we can pollute. <laughs> but of course, in the cities, that will be better. That's uh, an argument in, the China, in, in China. Well, you take it or not. Uh, but <laughs> uh, Okay. Um, so... Uh, you, have this, you can have this type of argument, and it's also, well, you, you, the, the problem of the energy at the national level is more complex than only for, uh, because in many recommendations from mobility side, well, of course, the, this uh, energy mix is one problem. But the problem at national level, it's a bit more complicated because uh, energy is used in many aspects not only uh, mobility, but also uh, domestic, industrial uh, uh, sectors. So at national level, you have to uh, develop a plan which includes all these aspects at once. You are not only uh, talking, focusing on electromobility, because if you use uh, charcoal for cooking, uh, it's not very good as well. So and in many countries and emerging countries, that's the problem. How to use how to, to, to modify the energy mix so that uh, every sector is uh, going well, if you want, on the impact on, on air quality. So mobility is not the only aspect you have to take into account. And when you are talking about mobility, when you are trying to develop electromobility or clean mobility, uh, you, have to, you, you are in a framework 
which depends on national strategies on energy, which is much more important today. Okay, so that's the first level, and then you can talk about energy uh, uh, mobility. And but you have the framework. That's why for me, uh, we can talk about electromobility. Electro sorry, with this notion of mix of energy mix, but it's uh, I would be it's uh, a constraint. It's uh, well, you can't do anything about that, except if you are at the national level. So. It's, uh, for me, it's not to push this away, but it's just to say that uh, when you develop electromobility, you can't act on the energy mix of your country. It's not possible. Unless you have local production, okay, of course, but it's, another <laughs> it's yet another problem. And quite often, you don't have enough. So you can put, and we will see, you can put... Um, uh, car parks or bus uh, depots with a lot of uh, uh, photovoltaic panels. Of course, this is a way to, to, uh, to, 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 to put uh, the electricity in the bus network or, or on the vehicles, but, uh, well, it's, it's just a part of it, so it's not the global aspect. Okay, so come, coming back to charging, you have several ways of charging, okay, you have, you, 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 you have read that, and to, to resume that, you have several levels. Uh, the, the only thing is the, yes, um, the vehicle to grid charging. So, you know that uh, sometimes we talk about the fact that the vehicle can store the energy and give back the energy to the grid system later when you need energy. But, um, uh, this is possible, okay, of course, this is possible. But it's also a very complex problem because you need to have uh, a, a very good monitoring of the system when the grid uh, asks to ask back the energy. That's a problem. And you have also a problem of, well, of the software and all the system to do that, which are not yet fully uh, developed or not enough developed to do that. And of course, you have also the, the cost of that and the payment of the energy you gave back because you've paid to, to have it in your car and then you, have, you, you must be paid to give it back. So it's a bit complicated and even if it's technically possible, I mean experimentally possible, uh, it's not yet possible in, a, well, in real life, I would say. Well, I, since the time is going the different ways. Just, uh, just one, uh, because yesterday we talked also about that, you have also, uh, a lot of uh, apps uh, which can give you where to charge your vehicle. That's one, uh, Mobive, which gives you the, well, everywhere, not everywhere in Europe, but uh, in many, many places in Europe, you can have the, exactly the, you can have access in real time to the uh, different charging stations and also what is possible or not possible. If you can charge, not charge, if the stations are free, you can book and so on and so on. There's a lot of uh, applications do, doing that. Another way to change batteries is the swapping. We have to talk of that. I'm not uh, quite... Uh, uh, convinced of the interest on that because uh, if you want to change your battery that means that it's not so <laughs> easy in fact mm -hmm. the batteries are not so just a big pack that you push on the batteries are, are several packs sometimes they are complicated they are quite heavy so it's a bit uh, it's more complicated than, than that and uh, it means also that all vehicles must have the same batteries which is not possible because the manufacturers are not <laughs> do not agree uh, for many many reasons to have the same batteries. So uh, so well, it can work, uh, but not for for me not for cars. That, well, the, there was uh, there are several tries in fact to to have that uh, in Europe, and the first was in Israel, in fact. A joint venture between Renault and Israel, uh, 
but it didn't work. <laughs> and it, they tried to implement it in Europe, and uh, it didn't work. And to, to finish on that, uh, what we have to, uh, to, to discuss about that is the cost of ownership, <laughs> which means the, the cost that you have to pay, which is uh, a bit complicated to, uh, to compute, to calculate, even if, uh, even f well, even for, 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 for the individuals, but what we, co what we uh, call the total cost of ownership is all the cost that you have to pay for your vehicle, okay, including maintenance, including energy, and so on. And if you look, <laughs> and uh, for the cars, you have this, and you can see that uh, well, it's been done in 2020. Uh, well, uh, in, that has been done in 2016, but it's still work. It's still. Uh, Good. So you can see that uh, the uh, pop up, j'ai perdu. The electric here is rather is here for 2030. And now it's even less because the cost of batteries have gone down. So uh, that you can see that it's much less than ice cars. Okay. So, uh, do you have any question up to now? Because it's a bit, uh, uh, well, I wanted to, to, well, it's very quick, in fact. <laughs> but uh, we can talk about, about buses a bit more, if you want, and implementation of buses, or, uh, yes. Je pense que la mobilité électrique, euh, on, on voit que c'est une solution. Or, ce n'est pas une solution. Euh, c'est une façon de réduire euh, les inconvénients de l'utilisation euh, des carburants. Donc, euh, moins de CO2. Euh, mmh. Mais euh, au niveau de la mobilité, euh, que ce soit voiture euh, euh, à combustion ou voiture électrique, euh, le, le même problème existe. Donc, euh, je pense que euh, la solution, c'est dans l'électrique au niveau des transports collectifs et la solution dans euh, les, la, les, la mobilité active. Il faut mm -hmm. qu'on travaille sur ça. Tout à fait d'accord. Yes, I agree. I agree with you. But I wanted to, we have to, to know what is possible with electric. I agree with you that... Um, if you replace, as I said before, if you replace a, a, car, a nice car by an electric car, that's no, no, no use, in fact. We have to think about mobility in another way. But, uh, the, well, and of course, of mass transport, buses, uh, and uh, public or, or collective transport, of course. And, uh, and when you arrive, some uh, soft mobilities or, or, or light mobility modes, which can be also electric. It's an, yes, it's, but it's, uh, it's the way you think about your, you design your transport system. Okay. So, but, well, just a bit about buses, if you want, or... Okay. Well, unless you have other questions, if you... <laughs> we can jump on uh, other questions. Well, I go quickly. Or you prefer to, to have the pause now? Both, <laughs> because uh, we can go on a bit. Are you still? Uh, oh, you are. You are. <laughs> a bit, a bit more before before the the pause. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. I wanted buses. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you.
OK. I will, uh, well, basses. The challenge for the basses, for all well, basses, means BRT, basses, electric basses used well, in basses network or, or BRTs. OK. Well, there are several challenges so for, for this mass transport, the purchase, you know, the organizations of operations and uh, the, uh, in the availability of the energy and interoperability. This I already talked about. So, uh, when you develop uh, this uh, system, well, you have, well, several stakeholders to consider. And each of them have a specific role, okay? So, uh, you have the charging service operator, you have the public authority, you have the city, and so on and so on. So, each of them has a role, and if you want to develop a good tra uh, uh, transport system with buses, you need to have all these people around the table with different roles. Uh, the charging supply organization, the DSOs and so on, need to have need to be uh, involved of course that's evident because uh, if you according to uh, what type of buses you will have you will need power if you need the power at the depot or you need the power at the end of line or during the line so uh, you need to have connection at the grid every time you well at all uh, charging points but it's not like uh, cars you need to have a, a, a lot of power there. So you need to have the availability of energy, the possibility to have the energy at this point when you will charge. So this is why the DSOs are quite important. You can't uh, design uh, an electric bus network without a good knowledge of the uh, possibilities of, of the availability of energy. Uh, Two weeks ago, uh, I was asked to think about electrifying buses in one city in France. The first question is, do you know where, is, where are the points of charge and do you know the connection with the grid? That's the first question, before all, because this will, uh, of course, this will um, impact your design and in some cases that will change the line because you don't have the possibility to have the enough energy at the terminals. If you, have, if you need the energy at the terminal, you don't have the enough energy. Okay, so the, one of the first uh, main important stakeholders are the uh, <coughs> suppliers of energy. The others, okay, that's the same. Uh, public transport authority, of course, you know the role. The bus operator, as usual, that's the the one thing we will change, we will talk back of that in, maybe in the future, is the maintenance of the vehicle and the competencies of the employees. When you, uh, that's also <laughs> one important question uh, when you deploy electric buses. Because uh, to maintain the buses, you need electricians. You don't need, well, you need less mechanics than electricians. So you need to have the competencies in the maintenance people, uh, the, the electric competencies and qualifications. In France, you need some qualifications to plug in the buses, for instance. So uh, you, have, you have to think of that because sometimes it takes longer to train the people than to implement the buses. If you look, uh, for instance, it's not buses, it's, uh, it's uh, trams or, or, or light trains. Light trains in, if you look at that, in, uh, the example was in Dakar. They have a new light train, okay, which is operated by a, 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 a company which is called CETER. And CETER is part, well, at the beginning was SNCF, was, was linked with SNCF. But the main problem for them was to find the right people, the right competencies to uh, design at the beginning and then to uh, maintain the, the, the trains. Okay? And they had to train them in France, which cost a lot. Uh, 
And now they have specific trainings for all the people there. Okay? On the well, on different aspects, but especially on the maintenance aspects. And that's the problem with all the new uh, implementation of electric buses, is to have the right people and the right competencies. And this takes at least two or three years to train the people in the right way. So when you talk, when you think about having this type of e-buses, you also need to think about to, to think about the training of the future training or the training of the future people. And you have and you need to have a bus operator which is able to do that. To charge the buses today, you have several uh, ways. You have the conductive charging and you have the inductive charging and you have the battery swapping, the same as the vehicles, which is still a use uh, for, for small buses because they have small batteries. Okay. Uh, the first, for instance, the first small buses we had in La Rochelle were uh, with battery swapping. Okay, but it's complicated because it, it's quite heavy, so you need special engine, uh, and you need also special uh, people trained to do that. And you have on the conductive charging, which is, which is the classical way, okay, you have several types. You have the, the connector, you have the charging uh, with the, the pantograph or, or under the ground-based ACD, the, the, the charging uh, diary. You have the trolleys and catenary charging, and you have the new system, which is the TOSA charging with a fast, ultra-fast charging uh, system, which is quite new. There's only three uh, applications in, uh, in the world for the time being. <laughs> which, uh, one is in Genève because it is Swiss, one is in, or two in China, and one is in Nantes. So the conductive charging, you know that's the connector, the TOSA we, we've seen, and you see all this type of uh, charging the buses. That's why when you have this, <coughs> because you need the, the, well, the power is quite high, that's why you need to have uh, uh, people or, or operators which are trained to do that. Uh, we'll see that later. It's <laughs> a video, but we'll see that later. Uh, that's the pantograph system, different type of pantograph which go, on, go, go up, go down, it depends. Uh, so that's the one which is going up. And you have the ground base, so the basses is going in on this platform and just plug are going on, on the knees. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't want to, to have that. The, and this is... Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> and this is the TOSA system, which is the flash uh, flash charging, ultra fast, which can transfer something like 600, uh, 600 kilowatts in 20 seconds, which is quite a lot. Uh, the idea with that, um, so the idea of that is the uh, the charging is done well. It's an opportunity charging, so that means that. The, the charging is ongoing, uh, but when the bus stops, at the bus stops, this device automatically, automatically connects, and during the bus is stopped, that the passengers go in and go out and go in, which is 20, 30 seconds, then the, well, the bus is charged, okay? It takes two, three seconds to adapt the system, to connect, and then you have something like 15, 20 seconds to charge with a power of 600 kilowatts, which is quite a lot. Okay, so it works. It is a bit expensive for the time being, but this system is now uh, uh, sold by Itachi, which bought the license. And uh, 
it will be, for the time being, it's also, uh, there's only one uh, manufacturer, bus manufacturer, which uh, has this system, which is a Swiss company. And, uh, but other, but uh, Itachi is uh, working with other uh, companies, bus manufacturers, to have uh, this uh, device deployed on their buses. So they are working with others to have uh, buses uh, compatible with this system. We have the catenary charging that you know. And the inductive, the inductive charging, which is just, uh, well, you know, like, like cooking. It's the same uh, thing <laughs> when you have induc induction to cook uh, uh, at home in the kitchen. It's the same process. You have the power which is transmitted through uh, two connectors, which are not connected, in fact, they just emit. Uh, but the difficulty with this uh, charging is that you need to have an exact position. Not, well, not so exact as it was some years ago, but you have to have an exact position. So it's still uh, difficult and it's still a bit expensive. The battery swapping, I've already told about that. And now uh, we are going to the different ways of charging. So you have the depot charging, you have the opportunity charging, you have the different types. So for the advantages, you can, well, you can have disadvantages and advantages for uh, each of these type of charging. Of course, if you have the depot charging, you have, uh, well, you just plug, the, the cost is less of, uh, because uh, you, don't, you have normal buses with a normal plug. We don't have pantograph, you don't have this system on the roof and so on. So it's cheaper on the buses. Uh, the inconvenient, the main disadvantage is that you need uh, large batteries in the buses so you have less passengers. Okay, so you have to balance between the number of passengers and the cost of the buses. Because otherwise you have the opportunity charging, which is you charge during the way, you are during the distance, so you charge either along the way or at or end or at the terminal station. You can charge if you have time, because you need some time, of course, because you can't, in some uh, organization, at the terminal, you can wait for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it depends. But in some organization, you have only three, five minutes. So uh, you don't have time to charge, f to recharge fully your buses. Okay. So you have to ch This is uh, a strategy of charging. We will come back to that a bit later if we, you want. But the opportunity is good. Well, the advantages are that, of course, you have less batteries in the bus. So that the bus itself, uh, with the batteries, the batteries you have less cost of the batteries, but you have the cost of the pantograph, which is going up or going down. Well, you need the device on the roof, and you can take more passengers. Okay, and the disadvantages are, of course, the cost of infrastructure because you have to, you need to have some uh, poles uh, with the pantographs going down or uh, receiving the pantograph, and then. Uh, and, some, and you also you have the connection to the grid, so you need, as I said before, the connection, uh, you have the, the power supply at the grid. Okay, that's the way. And for the inductive charging, for the inductive charging, the advantages are that it's quite easy, because you have just to plug. Otherwise, uh, but it's, uh, you, 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 the, the, well, you, you don't have this because, uh, well, but uh, you can have only fast charging, so you need power again uh, as a station. So it's a bit complicated to have that. And you, the, the disadvantage also is that um, you have the precision, the position of the bus is complicated. Okay. I think, yes, we, we won't go that to that. So I just suggest to stop now, okay, for a while, for half an hour, 
and come back on uh, explaining on uh, examples that will be more uh, practical. <laughs> on some examples and some more uh, uh, recommendations for implementation. Okay? Thank you.